Last week was action-packed, but the weekend has been full of dramatic comings and goings. Yes, our busy brood of blue tits was living very, very dangerously. And our swallows came face to face with an intruder. And I'm in Scotland on the trail of a controversial but fascinating animal. So welcome to an unmissable wet and windy... Oh! A spring watch! You broke, broke your own, you broke your own. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Spring Watch 2017. It's our second week coming to you live from the Sherbourne Park Estate here in Gloucester. Run by Gloucestershire, run by the National Trust, of course. And to be honest, we've had a bit of a damp day. We've had a very, very damp day. It's been absolutely lashing down here, lashing down. I tell you, a lot has happened over the weekend. The weather has changed dramatically. But as for the wildlife, there's been lots of comings, lots of goings, and lots of birds staying still. So who's been doing what? Well, let's have a little catch-up and let's start with the nation's favourite bird, the robin. Now, here's our nest. There are four chicks in there. They're 12 days old. And what you will notice is they're very different to the adult. I mean, you wouldn't even know that was a robin chick. Instead of that red breast, they've got a spotty plumage on their chest. And they only get that red breast after their first molt, which is in the late summer. But you can see it's fairly sheltered, the nest, but they are sort of keeping quite down in the warmth of it, aren't they? Let's see what happened over the weekend, because we did think that they were going to fledge. The adults come in and has been feeding them. You can see that lovely red breast on the robin there. They were doing lots of wing flapping. They were really teasing us from Thursday onwards. I love those little tufty bits on their head. They look really full of character. But this was going on all weekend and we, we thought that by Monday they would be gone. But then the rain started and they decided to stay put, which is actually a pretty sensible strategy because even though they fledge at around 14 days they don't fly for another couple of days and they don't actually leave the, the sort of area around the nest for at least two to three weeks and the parents keep coming back to feed them so i think they probably made a good choice to stay nice and warm well, in that nest for a couple of days. Not, no rain has fallen into that nest all day so the adults have found the perfect place for them but they do want to get out it's a bit like those chiff chaffs we were watching last week when they get to that stage you don't want all your chicks in one barn Basket. And if they can move out into the surrounding area, if a predator arrives, it might get one or two of them, but not the whole lot. And that's what we expect to see in the next couple of days, if, mm. of course, it stops raining. Another brood of birds that we were looking at last week were our swallows. And we left them on Thursday with three youngsters in the nest and one egg. They're in a barn down in the village there. Here's the outside of the barn. But when we look at the swallow's nest, I'm afraid to say it's empty. Who could be the culprit? Well, hanging around the village in large numbers are gangs of jackdaws. And of course, these cunning crows have their own broods at this time of year, all of which are pretty hungry and needing food. So, what happened on Saturday morning? Well, this is it. Here are the swallows there, three chicks in the nest, but look who arrives. A jackdaw has spotted them. One disappears straight away. At the bottom of the screen, you can just see the jackdaw with it in its beak. Very rapidly it comes back, peers at the camera and then takes a second chick, leaving just one. Now at this point the swallows come back, one of the adults returns, can clearly see that there's a problem there and then there's a little fracas where this swallow does the best it can to drive off the jackdaw but it's a mismatch of some magnitude to be quite honest with you. The swallow's not going to be able to drive this bird away and once a crow like this learns the whereabouts of some food it's simply going to keep back coming back and taking them and there you can see the third and final chick disappears mm. there. Now jackdaws, member of the crow family, quite closely related to things like jays and magpies and these birds are famed for taking eggs and chicks out of nests at this time of the year but typically jackdaws don't. We spoke to Lee Barber at the BTO and he's been monitoring the study of these birds in Leicestershire and they found there that 81% of their diet was meat but none of it 
was gathered through nest robbing. They were feeding principally on soil invertebrates or soil surface invertebrates, so things like earthworms and leather jackets or beetles and crane flies, those sorts of things. So this is relatively unusual for jackdaws and, of course, unlucky for our swallows. Very unlucky for the swallows, and my mum, for one, is going to be very upset because that was her favourite nest. I know, but what about the jackdaws? You've got to think that somewhere out there in a nook or a cranny somewhere is a cutesy, wootsy, jacky, wacky, fluffy, <laughs> wuffy little dawdaw, and it needs food too. It's all part of the cycle of life. So, yes, disappointing for the swallows, but they will re-nest almost straight away. They'll make another nest, and they'll certainly have another clutch of eggs. I've said it before, you can empathise with the prey, but you mustn't demonise the predator. Indeed. What's happened to our blue tits? We left them on Thursday. They were also ready to fledge. We thought they might fledge that evening, if not Friday or Saturday. Well, lots of you were watching the webcams online and on the internet. In fact, over a million of you watched the action on Facebook Live. But for those of you who weren't watching, here's an update. When we first met our blue tick family last week, the chicks were already well developed, but we noticed that one of them, who we called Runty, was smaller than the rest. But despite his size, he seemed to have real character. Over eight hours on Friday, he grabbed 40% of all the food coming into the nest, so we had high hopes that he would make it through. In fact, he was the least of our concerns. A woodpecker was becoming increasingly interested in the box, looking for a quick takeaway. And every time he did, you can see the chicks hunker down, quietly waiting for the probing tongue to go away. The one glimmer of hope was that the woodpecker only seemed to explore the nest in the afternoons. So if the chicks were going to make it out safely, the morning would be the best time to go. And so, to our relief on Saturday morning, the fledging started. With no woodpecker around, one by one, the chicks were making it out safely. But as the morning progressed, it started to become clear that something was wrong with Runty. As the last of his siblings left, he became too weak to carry on. The adult did come back, but by that point it was too late. He was gone. But what we've got to remember is that for a family of blue tits, eight out of nine healthy fledglings is actually a huge success. And seeing them all out and about just goes to show how brilliantly this family has done to get these gorgeous fluff balls out into the world. Eight out of nine. It is a good success, but what about Runty? We were rooting for him. Chris, what do you think happened? Because. As we were saying, he was the least of our worries. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's very difficult to say, but very often when adults give birth to their young, they can identify almost immediately if there's something wrong with them, something which we can't see ourselves. So if they give birth to a litter, you've got three or four of them the same. One, they keep excluding, and you're looking at it, and you're thinking, why are they driving that one out all the time? But when it eventually dies and you get a post-mortem, it's got something wrong with its liver, it's got something wrong with its kidneys, it's got neurological problems. Somehow or other, they can know that. They sense, they sense that. Maybe they weren't giving it enough food and because they knew it was going to be a waste of food because that one really was the spare. But then again, yesterday it was given loads of food. I know, then he seemed to buck the trend, he was up there clamouring for food, but again, maybe they were giving him food, but it wasn't going anywhere. Maybe he wasn't metabolising that properly. Uh, properly you Poor know. old Runty, though. Well, you say that, but eight out of nine getting yeah. out there. And I have to say, as I, um, as I did in Unsprung earlier, they have a really astonishing survival rate. I said 34% earlier, I was wrong. It's actually 38% of blue tits, well, the, if they fledge successfully, will get through their first year. 38%, that's very high when you think of all mm. the perils that are out there. They normally live for about three years and they breed in their first year. So having eight out at this stage is really good. That is really good. And as we're seeing, you know, there is so much involved in raising a family successfully. I mean, first of all, you need to find a good nest site, then you need to find plenty of food. Those are the two key things. But having a good start to life, as I found out a couple of weeks ago, can affect more than just a better chance of survival. Britain's 
only true aquatic songbird, the dipper, is perfectly adapted to a fascinating river lifestyle. But when they aren't foraging underwater, they habitually bob up and down or dip on the surface. Highly territorial, it's thought this behavior is a way of signaling around the noisy, fast-flowing rivers and streams where they live. But the best way to let other dippers know that you're around is to sing. And unlike most other songbirds, they sing all year round, helping them to defend their territories. The importance of that song is being investigated in the Yorkshire Dales by Dr. Stuart Sharp from Lancaster University. Morning, Stuart. Morning. I'm liking this office. This is bird watching with a bit of style, isn't it? This is one of the more luxurious spots, but we're actually just a few metres away from the dipper nest. Oh, so. I could see one. So this is the female coming in now. Yeah, there we go. So that's got a big face full of stonefly and caddisfly larvae, which is caught from the bottom of the river. And there we go. This river is, is very rich in food. This is a, a prime location, if you like, and we've got lots of dippers breeding along this river. But what my research really is about is trying to understand song development. There's been an idea out there for some time from captive studies of birds that when chicks are developing in the nest, the amount of food that they receive and the quality of, of their diet can actually affect the quality of their song in adulthood. So each year, Stuart follows up to 40 nests across a variety of territories, monitoring every aspect of dipper life and recording how they sing. So I can play you some of those recordings now. This is a male. It was raised somewhere where food was plentiful, so it's had a, a good start to life, and so it's producing a nice, rich, complex song. Oh, well, even I can hear that the bird is using a lot of different notes. Yeah, so there's lots of syllables. They're mm. coming thick and fast. One, two, three, four. These are all the same here, so that's five. That's obviously all the same. Six, seven, eight, nine. But if we now compare that with a different male, this time this is a male that was raised on a, a territory where there's a lot less food available, so he sounds like this. Well, I can hear that's distinctly different. He's repeating a lot of the same notes. Yeah. So if we just count again, you can see you've got one type repeated there. So that's one, two. This one is the same as these here. So that's three, four, five. That's fascinating. And the basic message is that if you're in a situation where there's less food coming in, mum and dad aren't feeding you as much, then you're going to produce a more structurally simple song. And is that because you haven't had the, the time to learn a complex song or you haven't got the energy to learn it? It's about the trade-off in how you invest your energy. So if everything's great and there's lots of food, you can invest energy both in your body growth but also your neural growth, the growth of your brain. And then how will that affect that chick as it grows into adulthood? So if you have a more complex song, you're going to have higher reproductive success and you're also going to be better able to defend your territory. So these males are also singing to advertise to their neighbouring males that they're there, they're in good shape, so stay away. So defending the right territory is key. But the look of a place can be deceiving. Well, Stuart, this looks absolutely beautiful to my eyes. It's an absolutely beautiful location, but if you just look at this stream and compare that with the river that we saw earlier, you can imagine that there's a lot less food available in that water. And in fact, if they want to go to a really good feeding site, they've got to go several hundred metres downhill that way. It's coming, here we go. You hear that? Yeah. And that's the chicks being fed. So in a, in a territory like this, these chicks are getting less food during the, the growth period. So that completely backs up your, your theory and your data. But how relevant is it? I mean, how can those results be used for conservation? Well, I think this research is all about understanding how what goes on in the early part of life can affect animals in the later part of life. 
and thinking about the bigger picture, that really allows us to try and understand how wildlife responds to environmental change. Well, I guess that applies to so many species, including ourselves. It's all about your upbringing. You need a, you need a good home, lots of food, makes you a very strong, healthy, successful person, or in this case, a dipper. Absolutely. beautiful thing. What an absolutely joyous little piece of science that was. Dr Stuart Sharp, we salute you. I mean, it makes sense that he actually went out there and proved it. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, we don't have any dippers here at Sherborne. We're only occasional vagrants when they get lost, but we do have a couple of lovely brooks and rivers. Let's cut live to them now. What have we got? Well, there we are. That's down on the Sherborne Brook. Uh, you can see a mallard there. It's a rather miserable looking mallard because the weather is pretty miserable out there this evening. But nevertheless, this environment, what we call the riparian environment, is incredibly beautiful and also incredibly productive. You see, what it is, is an eco-cline. It's where land meets water. Therefore, you've got terrestrial animals using it and you've got aquatic animals using it. You've got semi-aquatic and amphibious animals using it. And this means it's an area of tremendous richness and importance when it comes to biodiversity. But let me tell you a little bit about it. The European Water Framework has looked at the quality of rivers in Europe and only 43% of them are in ecologically good status. 43%, that sounds pretty poor. But what about those in Britain? I'm shocked to tell you that only 17% of our rivers in Britain are good and only 0.08% of them are in high order. So our rivers are not too good in condition. Why is that? Over abstraction of water for irrigating farm crops, uh, runoff from farms, spillages from sewage works, runoff from roads is another issue. And of course, pollutants finding their way into those water courses. And this is a tragedy because this particular uh, habitat can be enormously rich. The range of species that lives here is absolutely phenomenal. It starts with all the plants, of course, but then you've got the insects which feed upon those and then the insects that feed on insects, like these dragonflies. You need the emergent vegetation for things like mayflies to get out of the water. When you've got amphibians, you've got things like grass snakes. And when you've got all of this food, you've got mammals that come here to feed as well. Things like water shrews, water voles. And then, of course, you've got keystone predators in this environment, things like otters too. And they simply can't live in areas which are polluted and where there's no fringing vegetation. So let's take a look at this over here. This is a diagram of the riparian zone, as we call it, and this is an idealised uh, section here on the right-hand side. What we really want is forest, is trees on the bank, and they act as a buffer. They act as a buffer for any diffuse pollutants which are blowing through the air. Perhaps they've been sprayed onto farm fields. That stops them.
helpful. Below over the top of it. Believe it or not, that's a beaver lodge and we know there are beavers inside that. Now, beavers, fascinating animals. Uh, special feeding area. and they can take a really big tree down. They tend to do it a lot. It turns its head.
here, Martin. Another beautiful little pond. Beautiful in this light, actually. Isn't it gorgeous? Yes, yeah. a lot of insects moving here as well. Yeah. But you can see here the, the amount of materials that they're using to, uh, to build the dam. There's nothing there, but just be just before we came on air, we did see some. Just diving around there, but the trouble.
took a very wintry turn. A freak blizzard transformed the landscape. It seemed
full. Fantastic, hey? Fantastic. Should we have a quick... the same Now again, here they are, you can see just that, that warm dot, that's a beaver. You can almost see it glowing in the water, it leaves a little trail of warmer water behind it. Less nervous now, they'll come out onto the bank to look for food, but very, very nervous. Look at that huge tail, it's a fat reserve, that tail, with strong tendons in it, and the muscles are near its bottom, and they can, if it's really frightened and wants to move fast, it'll use its tail.
The female dashes for cover at the water's edge. middle of a vast